Okay, hi everyone. Hello. If I could ask you to um, be quiet. <laughs> that would be great. Um, so thank you. Welcome to the afternoon plenary. Uh, my name's Ed Wallace. I am head of policy at Locality. Um, and as many of you will know, uh, locality is campaigning for councils to turn the tide on large-scale outsourcing and keep it local. We know that the challenges facing local authorities are unprecedented, um, and over recent years, um, many have sought savings by bundling up services into mega outsourcing contracts that go to large providers at the lowest price possible. Um, at locality, we believe there is a better way, and that's to keep it local. By commissioning community organizations to provide services, we can create better, more responsive services that transform lives. We can reduce the long-term pressure that's building on the public sector uh, by solving people's problems at source. And we can ensure that precious public sector resources invest in the local economy rather than leak out of it. So this is something that we've been shouting about for a number of years now at Locality. Back in 2014, we published Saving Money by Doing the Right Thing, which um, showed that there are diseconomies of scale. Um, and at convention last year, we published the findings of our action research with six local authorities into the local economic benefits of commissioning community organizations. And now it feels like things are really starting to change. Um, the entire outsourcing market is under increasing scrutiny following the collapse of Carillion. Um, and growing numbers of councils are looking to do things differently. So we're delighted to be partnering with Lloyds Bank Foundation for England and Wales on a new phase of our Keep It Local campaign. We are working in Bradford and here in Bristol to try and help turn Keep It Local principles into practice. And next year, we are gonna be asking councils up and down the country to join our Keep It Local network uh, and help us build momentum behind a new direction for local services. Um, so as part of this work here at convention, we are launching a new toolkit for locality members. Um, it's to show how you can help your local authority become a Keep It Local Council. Um, it outlines our case, our key asks, our evidence, and how we can work together at a national and local level. So we'll be discussing this in detail at the Keep It Local workshop that's tomorrow morning. Um, so please do come along to that if you want to find out more and get involved. And there's going to be copies at the uh, locality stand uh, in the foyer. And for anyone that's interested in this, please do sign up to our Keep It Local Network mailing list um, to find out more about what we're doing and to come to some of the share and learn events that we have been holding all around the country. But now we have a fantastic panel uh, to talk about the big arguments that are shaping the future of local services and discuss the new Keep It Local movement that's gathering pace. So, Adam, over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, you'll see in uh, your brochure that I'm listed as Jessica Studdett. <laughs> um, the observant amongst you will notice that I'm not Jessica Studdett. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Jessica is unwell. So um, I've stepped in for her. My name is Adam Lent. I'm the director of the new local government network. Uh, one of the really great things about my job is that I get to travel across the country uh, meeting the most uh, visionary, uh, imaginative, innovative people working in the public sector right now. And I've had really interesting conversations over the last year or so because it seems to me there's a bit of a shift occurring in the way the most visionary people in the sector are thinking about public services and local economy. Those people are not looking to big private sector contracts as the way to drive change anymore. Uh, but equally, they're not looking to the traditional bureaucracies and hierarchies of the public sector either to generate impact and change. Increasingly, there seems to be a convergence on the view that the key to meeting the many social challenges we face is to 
build a completely different relationship between the public sector and local communities. A much more collaborative relationship and something at New Local Government Network that we're arguing more and more is actually to hand real power, uh, financial power, political power, decision-making power over to local communities, to neighborhoods, to the various networks that make up uh, communities. So I'm really pleased that we've got this session here and three really uh, fantastic speakers to explore that shift and that change and how it can work. And I'm very pleased to say that our first speaker is one of those very visionary, imagin imaginative people uh, in local government, in the public sector, and that's Robin Tudnam, Chief Executive of Calderdale Council. Robin, thank you. Thanks, Adam, and um, thank you all. It's a real honor, actually, to speak at this event and our collaboration with actually New Local Government Network and Locality has actually been quite fundamental to the conversation that I think we'll be having this afternoon and what I want to say to you today. So, and there's a lot to say, and I know that I've got a pressure of time, so I'll do my best to stick to it and not overrun. And in the session, I'm going to say a few things about what local means for local government, and, but more important, perhaps, what local means for our places and why I think we're at an absolutely pivotal point in our places. And it's potentially a crisis, but it might be an opportunity as well. And in doing that, I'm not assuming that you all um, would describe the relationship with your local authority as wonderful, but it's possible that, that is the case. But I'm, I'm assuming that sometimes you might experience a bit of a can't-do approach. And I don't know if you can read that, but we're going to need a bigger nope might be the default position that sometimes you experience rather than a local by default position. And uh, I think that there's clearly a number of reasons for that, and austerity is one of them. It's organizational culture, it's competing priorities, and it's the kind of thing Adam touched on, which is that scale can sometimes be an easy solution or sometimes a way out of a difficult problem. But I am going to try and talk about why I believe that's not the way. And I'm also going to talk about the, the clumsiness of public sector organizations at times, and you'll probably recognize this from where the wild things are, and you may, may like me, know every word of it from reading it to my son where, uh, many years ago, but um, it does feel sometimes like maybe you're dealing with organizations roaring their terrible roars and gnashing their ter terrible teeth and rolling their terrible eyes, and actually you're not getting the kind of conversation that you need to have with local government, and not just central government, but I'm going to try and say how that maybe that conversation might begin to change. And again, I'm not sure you can all see this, hopefully you can, but there's something fundamental about the economy and place in all of this, isn't there? And the kind of choices that we're making and uh, the kind of world that we're living in. And, and I, I, I don't particularly want to single out any one organization, but I'm going to because I think it's just interesting just to give us an example, so you may use Amazon, you may not use Amazon. And uh, Amazon's a pretty much a feature in our lives. And um, I was talking to earlier about if anyone uses Electra and the way in which that's interesting in doing some data mining in our lives at the moment. But actually, you may not know that Amazon have just in the US bought 20,000 Mercedes-Benz fans. Uh, and that's the next phase potentially of not just being the ones that kind of have the product, but then supply the product. Uh, and they are doing that through people applying to then support and run those, those vans. But then, effectively, the Yodels, the Hermes, the FedEx kind of model. And that's a potential kind of economy thing, which is where the world may go, and, and is going in some ways. And I guess the challenge for us is then, is that just the one future that we have, and are there other futures? In, in Calderdale, I've been in post as chief exec for about 18 months, nearly 18 months now, and I've been in the place for about eight years, just over eight years. And this is vision thing. And I kind of have had the, uh, the benefit, I think, of trying to work with the place to create a vision for Calderdale for 2024. Not that long away, but I, I think we're living dog years at the moment, by the way. I think the pace of things that are happening mean that that actually six years is not a bad time frame to be working to. 
And I think there's something about the potential of a place and, and how you define the potential of a place, which is not about its length and breadth, but actually about the scope of its vision and the height of its dreams and its way to imagine what the future might be and see the potential in it. And, yeah, I am biased, I know, but... Um, ooh, sorry. But um, Calderdale is a special place, and it's a place, if you don't know it, and you may not know, is covering a range of towns and villages in West Yorkshire. Uh, one of the five Met authorities of, of West Yorkshire, part of the Italy region, virtually literally in the heart of the country, and a relatively small council running all services, but with an agility and a set of people, some of whom actually are in the room, who I think want to make something different happen and have had a few knocks. Our biggest employer, actually, ironically, is the Lloyds Banking Group. <laughs> and in 2008-9, an employer that now is growing and has 6,000 people employed in our borough was potentially in crisis. And we've had some other challenges since then. So how do we create a different conversation? And our vision is actually not a document. It's five words, which I'm going to come on to, but it starts from a notion that says, can councils step back a bit? Can we share the glory? Can we stop caring who maybe gets the glory and create something with unheard voices as well as heard voices? I've not got time to go into it now, but I'll leave a link to our vision website with an event with 200 people we launched in March, where actually we heard from a new business, a young person in care, um, and a person setting up a company called an Equal Care Cooperative who was seeking to create a digital platform to connect people that want to help others with people needing social care. And they're the kind of voices that we want to hear in our place and amplify. So our five words are, are these. They're enterprising and talented. We were at the heart in Halifax of the Industrial Revolution. Maybe the two things in the global sense that define this country are London, if we're honest, it's a global city, and the Industrial Revolution and the history that we have from that, the sense of civic identity and enterprise. And we want to build on that to be enterprising and talented. We're also a place that wants to be resilient and kind. And the word kindness actually seems to be growing in its sense of usage. There's been a report that Julia Unwin, who's actually going to be our keynote speaker at our next annual event in March, has launched through the Carne Carnegie Trust earlier this week about the power of kindness, the power of small acts of kindness to try and create a different way to be. And finally, to be distinctive. We want to stand out. We want to be special. And we want to kind of create a sense that there's a specialness to our place, uh, a uniqueness to our identity. I'm not going to read all of that, um, which is a kind of summary of what all that means. But I'm just going to pick out the final few words. There's a fairly wonderful philosopher and academic and community activist called Roberto Unger who talks about maybe just the one thing we need to do is try and help people live a larger life. And I think you've heard from the mayor of Bristol this morning. And maybe, and, and hearing from him, I think one way describing what he said is, I've been given a chance to live a larger life, a life a bit larger than maybe was expected of me. And we've all got our stories, and maybe many of us, and certainly my story wouldn't have been to be a local authority chief exec and, <laughs> uh, and, and ever having an expectation to do anything like that. How do we allow people to live a louder life, um, to reach their potential? And what does that mean? So what does that mean in practice? That's a, maybe a good set of aspirations. So we've been on a, a, a long journey to try and kind of make this work at all levels. And... It's true that bottom-up bottom up approach is the key to this. Um, and people talk about bottom-up and top-down, and I, I really don't like that because I think top-down is normally used in a pejorative sense. It, something's been forced. Actually, if you're in a leadership role, you've got a responsibility to do something. And you've got some authority and power that not only can you give away, but actually you can make some things happen. So I think we were the first council to, through our cabinet, agree a community anchors policy. And some of those anchors are in the room. A set of relationships that we have. We've also agreed a social value charter. That doesn't mean that we've got this right all the time. That we still don't have processes that are cumbersome. 
that we still don't feel stuck by whether it's procurement or legal, but we, we actually have a set of aspirations to do something different, that we are seeking to keep spend in the economy, that we are thinking to grow an inclusive economy, and that we give away some of that responsibility to our voluntary community services and alliance. We've just got something called Calypso that's just being formed, and our lead officer, Topeka, yes, he was at the King's Fund, talking about an assurance process that the sector has created for health and care in Calderdale, created for the sector with local service users by the, the voluntary community sector to assure quality. And that's the kind of way we might need to go forward. And there's something real about actually doing this and a parity of esteem in the good times and the bad and actually saying that sometimes things will fail and sometimes things that we're doing are going wrong and they're not working and we need to work on that. And we need to be honest about that. So what, do we do? what, are, we, what are we doing at local level? So on the Boxing Day in 2015, we experienced one of the biggest flooding events this, seen in this country for the last 10 years. Nearly 1,000 properties flooded. That's Hebden Bridge on Boxing Day. Not the best time of the year to be moving into a civil resilience emergency for obvious reasons. And at the absolute core of that was an organization represented in this room and the town hall run by the community through an asset transfer became a place for people weary, um, battle-worn, frightened, with no power, no resource, went to to turn to, and became a place where people came together and became something at the heart of the local economy. And that's very big in our Keep It Local story, and it's something we've got as a case study in the locality work that's being produced. Another example of this is actually something you may be surprised. If you've never been to Halifax, you may be surprised that's the centre of Halifax. And that's a building called the Peace Hall that has become begun to demonstrate a different experience about a town centre. We're very lucky to have that building in our town centre, one of only two remaining cloth halls remaining in the world, a Georgian building opened in 1779, and through independent shops, through events, through fun, through education and learning, it's now a thriving destination that we handed over to a newly formed trust to run, and very much at the heart of what we're trying to do in our place. But it's also the power of small interventions and our Staying Well program, part of our health and cares agenda, where we are trying to not only make sure that services are run by voluntary community organisations through micro-interventions, but actually we've handed over the commissioning of that, that work to the voluntary community sector. Um, three locality members, Hebden Bridge, Halifax Opportunities Trust and North Halifax Partnership, I think, in the room, standing back and giving that responsibility away and actually recognising that that's something that we need to do. And that's about the kind of things that we need services to do, which is making. It's about connecting and identity. It's about the kind of things that tackle the loneliness that affects many people's lives. The health research showing that it's now equivalent to 15 cigarettes a day. The second biggest cause of premature death, mm. potentially the, the evidence around that. And actually a new form of dance, a new way to actually develop a future for our communities. <coughs> and actually something that's not just standardization and one big approach. Mm -hmm. And working with our National Health Service, I've been in a room with Simon Stevens saying this is the future. And we've had a Secretary of State this, month, this week, Matt Hancock, talk about prevention. Well, this is the kind of future of health and care. Let's, let's make it so. Let's make it something that happens at this kind of scale. And let's rediscover what we bloody well came into local government to do, you know, 150 years ago, which maybe people like Joseph Chamberlain demonstrate, which is actually not just about having a bar chart smaller than the one we've got now, not just becoming a social care funding agency, which for us, we're now spending 63 pence in the pound on social care is something that we could be at risk of doing but actually rediscovering our civic identity, our sense of place. And I'm running out of time, and I just want to leave you with um, something from a very wise person who I've always found inspiring, because <laughs> Dolly <coughs> quite rightly says, it's not just about policies and procedures. We also need a bit of love. We need a bit of compassion. And it's possible to avoid doing almost anything 
but it's not possible to be avoid being somewhere. We all live in places. We live in localities, and they live in us. So if we start from that position, maybe together, with one social movement and one conversation, what might be achieved? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Robin. That was uh, really, really fantastic. A really fascinating insight into a completely different way of thinking about how a local council can work with its uh, local community in its area. Our second speaker is Heather Williams. She's the chief executive of Knoll West Health Park, which is a locality member uh, based here in Bristol. <coughs> Heather. Okay, I need to put my timer on because I'll go on forever otherwise. Yeah. Uh, I don't want you dragging me off the <laughs> stage. Okay, so as he said, I'm Heather Williams. I'm the CEO of the Noel West Healthy Living Centre, um, which is based in South Bristol. So if you're from Bristol and you're still in this room, it's because you know the traffic's too horrendous to even think about going home. <laughs> so thank you for staying. So the Healthy Living Centre has been open since 2002. I can't profess that I've been there all that time, which I've not. But um, it was an old school, a secondary school, that um, was closed down um, for economies of scale. And um, eventually it got burnt down. But the community got together and decided they wanted to use the site that is on for health-related activities. That could be gyms, um, fit walking, um, our sessions or anything that would improve people's health. So we've got a doctor's, two doctor's surgery on the site, dialysis unit, out of hours doctors. Um, so if you go to Brisdoc, you'll come to the health park and physiotherapy and disabled children's centres. There's a variety of things. So as a, as a charity, we aim to close the gap on health inequalities. That's what our articles say. But it's really impossible for us as a charity because actually education, the economy, um, and lots of, uh, sorry, lots of other factors impact health inequalities. But what we're trying to do is trying to build up people's resilience, their ability to be able to tackle the things that cause people in our community in South Bristol to die up to 10 years earlier than the Bristol average. And that's caused by um, things that if people were supported to change their behavior, they could improve. So th if they could do walk-in, change their diet, um, get connected back to their community, a bit uh, Robin said just now, they could improve their life and their lifestyle. So as an organization, we try to work with the local community in order to provide services that they've asked for. But we also provide some health-related activities. So we do social prescribing. That's a real buzzword for those people who are in health. Um, that's about connecting people back to their community. We do physical activities, health checks, stop smoking, walking, our peer groups, men's groups, women's groups, one-off events, mental health support for groups, partnership work, and then anything else that the community might ask for. So um, I... I I'm sure you're blessed because you're seeing me on there. I, am, I didn't have a chance to put together a slideshow, so I'm sorry for that, but I was preferring to do some work in the community. But I just wanted to <laughs> just say to you, <laughs> I just wanted to say to you that um, what I'm saying today is nothing that I'm sure any other organization across the country feels, that like keep it local. If you work in a local organization, if you've grown from the ground up with local residents campaigning, gathering together and adding something, whether they're a charity or just a small community group, we know what Keep It Local really means. We know the impact of Keep It Local. And we've heard rhetoric from different councils, and it's really interesting what you said, Robin, today, is that um, sometimes in charity, I feel like we're trying to move a tank down a no end no, no exit road, you know, we get down there, there's a lay-by, but actually all the cars are parked in the lay-by, how do you turn around and get back out that road? And so I feel um, there's often times we have to dance to other people's tunes. We bend up what we're doing to fit a bit of funding 
it's not really where our hearts are, but it looks a bit like what we desire to do. And we get there, and actually we get really good at that, and then, the, then it changes. What we need to do changes, so we, we then have to turn around and try and do something else. So I, um, I'm a great advocate that we should be doing things locally. I keep wanting to say locality now, just because it's everywhere in the room, but locally or community, when I say locality, that's what I'm actually meaning. So, it, so what, I, what I know is that if you do something locally, if you build projects locally um, with an eye on the community that you're in, you really can transform lives. And we'll all have stories to tell about that. So I was thinking about, um, there's a hundred stories I could tell you. I could tell you about the elderly lady who smoked for 63 years, came to stop smoking and is now quit for the first time she's ever tried it. Somebody came to us, he had really low self-esteem, diabetes, so they said come to the Healthy Living Center. He's lost five stone, took up walking, is now a walk leader. We had a trans woman come who, she was really scared to go out. She feared hate crime and was actually a victim of it. But she's had one-to-one -one support now, and now she's doing other community activities. Um, it's right, I'm, I'm going to go. Um, <laughs> so a local man who was depressed who came to our, our, our art on referral, and now he's doing a national art tour uh, um, of the pieces that he's produced. Well, if you knew South Bristol, you wouldn't ever associate art with the people in that community, or it would be—it wouldn't be the first thought that you you would think about. But he's gone on a national tour. So, what do we do differently? I think it's about relationship being in lo local area. People know where you are; they trust you. You build relationship. You're—I mean, you can tell I come from Bristol, but um, if you're from Bristol, you know I come from South Bristol. <laughs> um, you're like the people that you. You're, you're working with, you understand. You can't live somebody else's life and you don't understand that. But you, they recognize something in you. you, they feel trust in you. And we work with people whose lives are sometimes a complete mess. You know, they might say they want to stop smoking, but then you have to work out they've got debt problems and they can't feed their children or they can't pay the rent and they live in damp houses. So we have to unpick all of those and that, that journey with them um, makes makes a difference. So I wanted to fit. So we we know about locality. We know what it's like to be in the local community. We know that the voice of the community is really important. But the voice of the organisations understand those things. And if you've got a national organisation, they come in. They're really good. They bring a bit of money and a nice little project. And they come and ask you where all where they could connect with people. And then they do for their project and then they go. And that's okay, because that actually might move somebody a few steps forward, but it doesn't. My cake's cooked. <laughs> <laughs> but don't panic, because I'm not quite finished. I'm sorry. <laughs> I just one more. Right. I'm up here. And I suppose you could turn my mic off, couldn't you? Sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to tell you, so, so just a little story. So there's a lady who came to us a few years ago with anxiety and um, was overweight and w smoked. And she came to us and they set goals and she went to a woman's group and then she decided, actually, this is really good. I've stopped smoking. I've started riding a bike. I've lost a bit of weight. I'm going to go to this group and I'm going to volunteer to lead it. What she said to me was, if I haven't got a job in six months, I'm leaving. It's a waste of time, complete waste of time. Well, two years she was volunteering, running this group, but now actually she's employed by us. And what... and. That's just one story, and it's repeated and repeated. And for, for funders or for council, sometimes it's about, I, can, I got some paperwork here, which is graphs to tell you what do people think, what their life changes, what did they say about our services, what, how can we tie into this, how, can we, how many people have we seen. We can give you all the data you want, but that quality of data, that transforming lives, that's what you need to look at. If you really want communities to change in what you, s what you say and what you do, what you need to do is invest in local people and think about, it doesn't take five minutes to get into a mess, but it, and it'll take lo a long time. You need to invest in that long-term relationship with people to make a real difference. 
I'm sorry, I can bang on forever, so I will say she's telling me to wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> not that I've not been told that before. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Heather. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, our final speaker is Paul Streets, who is the chief executive of Lloyds Bank Foundation. They've worked very closely with Vocality on their Keep It Local campaign. Paul. Okay, thanks, Adam. <laughs> um, it's great to hear that. Um, I'm reassured that Adam really thinks that local government gets this, and Robin's clearly a real convert to small but local, but what I'm going to tell you is that not many local government people speak like Robin, from what we know. Um, mm. It's really great to hear you talk about kindness, actually, because it's so undervalued, it's never contracted. Julia Owens talked about it. You should read that if you haven't done it, Robin clocked it. It's a real insight into what the voluntary sector is best at. So I'm going to talk about three things. I'm going to talk about why we believe at the foundation small charities are the best. I'm unashamedly and unapologetically a champion of small organizations. Secondly, why they're in shit street, as far as we see it. And thirdly, a call to action, which will include to each of you, actually. Um, and first of all, I'll talk about our commitment to keep it local. We're very committed to working with this. We've been supporting locality in Bristol and Bradford. In Bristol alone, we fund 18 organizations. And just to give you a cameo, as Heather did, of the range of organizations we fund, we fund on the one hand the Mayos in Bristol, quite a sophisticated model, kind of franchise model, really effective, work with homeless people. Then if you go to the red light district in Bristol, we fund a charity called 125 that works with street sex workers. Then if you go up the road, you find a charity called Hive. What Hive does, is work with families who have adults with learning disability who are still at home, and parents who are having to deal with the reality of what it means, what is it going to mean for those children when they're still at home with you dependent and you die? And the charity helps them think about that. And that's the diversity of the sector, and I love the voluntary sector, and I love small charities. So three things, why we believe small works. First of all, the thing that local government needs to absolutely get is that how many of you work for organizations that have a turnover of less than a million pounds? Just put your hands up, yeah? So 97% of charities have a turnover of less than £1 million. They are local. Cancer <laughs> research, Oxfam, are completely atypical. The, the typical organization is 125, it's Hive, it's Emmaus. These are small local organizations. So while local government and national government like to think, they'd like to work with NCH Action for Children and all these huge mega charities, if they want to work with local charities and the charities, they've got to work with small and local. Why do they think we were? Well, last year, we were very brave. We said, well, we've funded these organizations for 33 years. We've put four, 450 million quid into them. Let's check it works, this assumption. So we asked Sheffield Haller to do some research for us to say, why does small work? So we published this on our website. Have a look. I think it's a good report. And it tells us these three, three things about why these organizations work. First of all, they work because of who and wh what they reach, who they reach. Secondly, because of how they work. And thirdly, of where they work. And they looked at a number of areas, and one is Bassett Law. And I know, I don't know if you're here, there's somebody from Bassett Law, Law Action Center. Somewhere, where are you? We fund you. You're one of the few people in the room we do fund because you're a charity, but it's very good to be able to support your work. Hmm. So why are charities distinctive? Well, first of all, the who. They're distinctive because of the service they provide and what they do. They're first responders. They're flexible. What this story tells us is their ability to establish trust with people who are neither trusted by nor trusting of society. Because typically, society has shattered them in some kind of way. It's benefit sanction. It's taken away their children. It's lost their housing. It establishes trust with these kinds of people. Secondly, it has a distinctive approach. Because it's personal. It's long term. They stick with people thick and thin. And they're very flexible in the way they do that. Because the gap between the trustees and the person who comes through the door is one or two layers. Not lots of layers. It's not somebody in London commanding somebody in Bristol to do something around a standardized contract. Thirdly, they have a distinctive position in societies. The report talks about the glue, the glue in society, services and communities, building them together. So they're more than the sum of the parts. They meet immediate needs, and they achieve small wins that lead to big gains. They drive demand down. They're pretty critical to driving demand down from what we see. And they, fund and they, and they generate money in the local economy. If you look at a local charity we fund, for every pound that local the local authority in Bristol provides, it brings in four pounds from other sources into Bristol, into the local community, employing people who live local, who spend local, who are employed locally and, and spend their money in the local economy. So that's why Small and Beautiful is great. Thirdly, the problem, the capacity crunch. Demand is rising, it's getting more complex as 
the NHS in particular raises the threshold of what it will provide. Secondly, money is shifting. We looked at, we looked at the data last year. 84% of public spend on, by local authorities goes to charities who have a turnover of more than a million. And yet 97% of charities are sub one million. Thirdly, commissioning is distinctly failing. It shuts them out because it's obsessed with standardization. And actually what these organizations are about is responding to needs as they come through the door and being flexible. Now, we know that local authorities are under extreme pressure. And we think we need to be working with local authorities to deal with that. And earlier in the year, we published a report with MPI, which talks about a quiet crisis. And what that highlights, again on our website, do have a look, um, what that tells you is this big shift from preventative spend. So if you look at homelessness, there's been a 46% reduction in spend on keeping people in their homes and a 58% increase in spending on crisis temporary accommodation. It's a tragedy, actually. And most of that is failure, cost failure demand, as, as the locality has talked about. Secondly, the cuts have hit hardest in the most deprived areas. 97% of cuts to people facing disadvantage have occurred in the fifth of the poorest local authorities. That's a disaster for people on the edge. So finally, the third, thir third the call for action, as I'm told to wrap up. My call to action, well, first of all, as a foundation, we put our money where our mouth is. We only support small local organizations. And we try to provide the development support. Well, we are a drop in the ocean. Our 25 million quid is very handy, but it's a drop in the ocean. So if you're a local authority, our creed occur is recognize the value of small. Recognize that four to one return you'll get by putting a pound into a local organization that will bring in four pounds from people like us. And we won't spend our money on a national organization, and many other funders are like us. Recognize that value of keeping local, employing people who live local, spend local, and contribute to the local economy. Use the Social Value Act. Put people before process. Really think about whether contracts work. We're passionate advocates of grants. We think grants work much better and can be about outcomes. And if you're a charity, how many of you charities, by the way, just out of interest? Yeah, so many of you are. You need to do something about this too, because charities, particularly local charities, are really bad at singing their own praises. You need to start talking about the contribution you are making to the local economy, the money you're bringing to the local economy, the people you're employing for the local economy. Not just assume that because the great stuff you're doing is great, it will be noticed unless you sing out your praises. And see local authorities as common cause, because we know that local authorities are really being shafted by central government. It's a shame James Brokenshire wasn't here, actually, because we like to say that to him. But actually, MPs and government need to listen to that, because we have common cause with Robin and his friends. We need to make sure they get more money, because they know the problem just as much as they do. We know they're not part of the problem. So if James Brokenshire was here, I'd say with his creed occurs what? Control, safety and economic resilience, inclusiveness, no community left behind. I'd say to you, James, you ain't going to do that unless you work with 97% of charities that are small and they're local. So keep it local. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Okay, so I am going to open it up to uh, comments or questions uh, from you lot out there. And you do seem to go back a very long way, so do wave if you're at the back. Um, we have uh, roving mics. We have to be out of this room uh, with very strict instructions to be out of this room at 5.40, so it could be turned around uh, for uh, the next event. So if you could just uh, say your name, where you're from, and keep your comment or question as brief as possible. That would be great. Right. Comments, questions from the audience. Uh. Hi. My name is Sarah Thelwall, and I run a thing called My Cake. And my question is to Paul. Um, in my experience of working with smaller nonprofits, they're very definitely not mini-me versions of the big guys. They're financially sustained differently. They face different challenges. They've got fewer people. I'd be interested in your views on how you support those smaller organizations who haven't got the, uh, all the lots of senior people in them or have cash flow problems. I mean, lots of people in the room are familiar with the problems of being a small non-profit, but I'd be interested in what you've learned from working with them on their financial sustainability. Thank you. Just I'll take uh, a couple more. Any other comments or questions? Yes, there's a lady here. Uh, 
Hi, Alison Haskins from Halifax Opportunities Trust um, in Calderdale. Hooray! Hey. <laughs> um, it's for everybody on the <laughs> <laughs> it's for everybody on the panel, possibly particularly you, Paul. Um, how about big and local? What? So could so yeah. hear that. Sorry, how about big, big and local? Do you want to explain a little bit? Just add a little bit of detail to that point. Okay, so um, I work for Halifax Opportunities Trust. We're local, locally governed, locally focused, right, accountable, but we have a £5 million pound turnover. All right, yeah. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Yes. I can't see whether that's a lady or a gentleman. No come on on you, it's just I can't see. Here you go. <laughs> Here you go. Hello, uh, Adrian Ball, Manchester Settlement. Um, a question about uh, commissioning arrangements that are being kept local, but a demand that local consortiums are, are put together to reduce commissioning costs for the council. Uh, so it's kind of, yes, keeping it local, but pushing a lot of those costs down to the providers. Um, they've got to manage their own structures. Anything else, or I'll come back to the panel? No, okay. Uh, so, Paul, do you want to deal with that first question about the capacity of smaller charities and how you can support them to work with the public sector and deliver big impact? Well, I could tell you what we do, and I guess I would want local authorities to mirror us, because the first thing is we don't abandon outcomes. Um, and that's the kind of, if you go, um, but we are committed to grants. So we think you can achieve what you achieve through a contract with a grant, and we do that. But the critical bit for us is that we want organisations to look out to those they support and up to their boards and not to us. So we want them to measure outcomes in a way that matter to the people who come through the door and be accountable to their boards locally. And as a funder, what we try to do is provide longer term grants. So increasingly in our new programme, where we're providing unrestricted grants, organisations can do what they want with them if they're funding the issues they want over six years and alongside that providing development support. But we would say we're one funder. And other funders, like there are many funders actually beginning to really rethink our model actually. But in the end, I think it's 3.5 billion funders like us give to largely small local organisations. Local authorities need to be critical to this too. And the enlightened local authorities completely get that. Actually, organisations are best funded by grants, not constrained by some contract specified by somebody who sits in an office who doesn't really understand what the needs of the people who come through the front door are. So that'd be, I mean, just briefly on big and local, because it was raised. I mean, no problem with that. We have a bit of an issue with big nationals coming in um, because they disappear as soon as the contract's gone and people are left behind, and we see that happen time and time again. Meantime, they've destroyed the local infrastructure and local organisations, so a huge issue. There's no problem with big or local. In the end, though, I would say 97% of charities are sub-1 million. That's a fact. So that's why we focus on, on, on that sub-1 million. And in a sense, we're giving an organisation £200,000 for extra six years. That would be peanuts for a 5 million organisation. For a small organisation, that can make the difference between surviving or failing. Mm -hmm. Heather, I was very struck by what you said in your uh, presentation there about sometimes feeling as a, a smaller organisation that you're sort of forced down a certain street and you get trapped and you can't get out. I'm mean, picking up that point. What sort of support would you like to help develop your capacity to have a bigger impact to you know, uh, reach the goals that you want to reach? I suppose it's about relationship with the people um, who are um, going to apply for funding. I'm, I'm looking at you, Paul, because you're sat there, but... <laughs> um, but th thinking about, I mean, I, I jested about not having the PowerPoint, but it's true that is you've got to weigh up what's important to you, and you really want to build relationship with funders, but that takes time. And when you're trying to do stuff, so I think, from my point of view, is I can't apologise enough that it takes a long time to transform people's lives. It's not. A one one year contract to three it could be a five year contract and it could take another ten years to really change, but how we look at change and transformation of people's lives and the impact so from a bank's point of view I suppose is that economic point of view from from somebody else is an educational point of view, but whatever it is that we as um i suppose local know that it takes a while to transform people's lives. And um, if we have to scrabble, so I'm interested that you said six years funding, because I mean, to me that sounds like a miracle, to be honest. <laughs> um, so I, so that movement is we we've got an equal voice to the funders. We're not the mm. puppets, and you're not mm. pulling our strings, which is what it's felt like for a long mm. time. 
that we're rising up. So um, in, in the place where I am, we're, we've built a w an old West Alliance of organizations who deliver completely different things, charities. But we're coming together and how can we share those resources and w um, not duplicate, but um, how to can we become a bigger body to really impact and transform people's lives? So mm -hmm. picking up on that, we had the point there about uh, councils requiring a consortia of organisations to get together. And I think there was a sense there that sometimes there are extra costs being imposed on smaller charities uh, in having to meet these sorts of commissioning conditions and requirements. Uh, do you feel that or the sense you seem to be giving there actually joining together and having that collaboration can have a big advantage actually? Yeah, so the, d the driver in the initial instance is obviously we've got charities and we want them to keep going because we think they're worthwhile. But it's about actually if we really want to transform community, we need to pull the resources together. And we've all been in funding bids where we're too small as individuals to commit to get commissioning. And we might not even want to, actually. Who wants that burden of having to keep mm -hmm. answering to funders when you really want to be making a difference on the ground? It's not that we're saints on the ground, but it's also that we want to do a good job. That's why we're in that industry. So I th so there's two things. There's actually there's merit in, in a partnership working uh, within your local community and across the city. But there is merit in thinking about commissioning and whether you can hold that and wha where the skills are within those organisations to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Robin? Yeah, just to touch on the point about alliances, I think, the I mean, Sean is in the, is in the room from, who works in, our c in the council, has done a lot of work about bringing people together. There is potentially a chance to reduce cost, duplication and effort by coming together for the right thing. Um, there are times when it's clunky and it doesn't work, but actually... We've had a multiplicity of different models of different organisations trying to compete. And that collaboration has given them to a chance to do something at a bigger scale. Not necessarily big, 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 but a bigger scale that's had impact, I think. The, uh, I think the, the thing around the, the big and local is that I think there is something as well about the scale of an organisation that grows from the place it's in. And that's the story of Halifax Opportunity Trust. that has been a 20-year journey, actually, but, but rooted in the place based around tackling poverty, but actually getting to a position of scale where rather than this thing in the local government that we kind of carry on doing what we're doing and then we give a few grants out for small nice things, which is not only unsustainable but misses the point, but actually that HOT's actually now run with two other organisations, our early year service for the council. So we put out our whole early years children's centre service to... Um, to a process, and yes, it is a contract, but actually they are running that. So that social care issue about where that's going and where that funding is going, actually the, the sector becomes that solution mm. so rather than it just being something that is terrible to deal with and we're going to deal with the national, I won't name them, but the big nationals will come in. But actually that the procurement and commissioning process, whilst not perfect, and I know it isn't, um, is seeking to try and create an opportunity for an organisation like that to get that contract. I'll just, I'll just see if there's any more uh, questions before I come back to you, Heather, because we've only got uh, a few minutes left. Any more questions? Yes, gentleman there. Hi, I don't want it to. I don't want to be sounding negative, and it's, it's or sounding a bit like accountancy. It was once said that there's no such thing as society. Was she right? <laughs> Okay, any other, there's, uh, yes, someone there, Sean Williams, their hand out. Oh, got yeah, Sean Williams from Toynbee Hall. Um, I'm really interested in how you keep coming back to the, com the kind of tension between competition and collaboration, oh. which is something that I'm seeing a lot in the work that we're trying to do, and, and really kind of taking that to the kind of strategic level, the, the myth of the kind of neoliberal economic model that we're all forced to work within where competition is seen as the tool for the best set of outcomes when all of our work shows that often it's collaboration mm -hmm. um, and I think the other thing linked to that is the issue around growth that we're focused as nations on the wrong type of growth we're focused on things getting bigger rather than getting better and I'd be really interested to hear from you as a panel how you think we as uh, small organisations wanting to deliver the right things for our communities might push back against some of those uh, kind of myths that, that kind of crowd us in. 
Thank you very much. Mm. Yeah, Heather, go on. Sorry. Jump on that. So I'm quite interested in that. Is that um, not necessarily that you need to grow your organisation because actually then you just become a big um, clunking machine potentially, but there are lots of resources within the your local area potentially or, or a bit wider. I'm So collaboration for me is the way to go. But I'm also recognised that actually for the last, I don't know how many, I, I decades I suppose, those um, organisations that you're now collaborated in for commissioning are the same organisations that you were competing against for funding and resource and local residents be involved in it and delivering and looking good in your community. So those people were competition and now you want to collaborate. And so I think it's really good, the rhetoric that you're, you're speaking, Robin, but um, I just know that actually for voluntary sector, we, we've got to unpick some things that we, we've done and we've been involved in and been pushed into and chosen at times. Um, to make this um, ability to be able to collaborate and be commissioned. So we, so it would be interesting to see in Culverdale how that works because I feel like we were in competition five years ago for w this pot of funding and now we're in collaboration and there's history and mm -hmm. lives and stuff in within Definitely. that. That's really good to hear. Cool. Do you want to pick up on that last point about competition and collaboration? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting point actually. I mean, it's... Um, I think there's something, what we don't do intelligently with the voluntary sector is decide when scale does matter because there are some things that are best delivered at scale. I mean, Cancer Research UK, we don't want to have 800 local organisations doing that. Things like domiciliary care to a degree, there are economies of scale that can be achieved and I think as a local authority it's sensible to do that. The problem is when that's applied to complex social issues that are very personalised, that are highly bespoke, that are best provided by small local organisations with local connections. And that's where, for me, competition really fails because you're absolutely to your point, you need organisations to collaborate. Because people will be dealing with a number of different organisations and they need to support that rather than get against it. I mean, the size thing I think is really interesting. I think it's about testosterone, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I went to speak to a group of small charity leaders that happened to be a cohort that we're funding at the School for Social Entrepreneurs. There were 24 of them. There were three men in the room. I think it's very interesting, actually. Big charities obsessed with market share. They seem to think they're successes. And I think as a sector, I'd say the Charity Commission is at fault here because some of these organisations are not charities. There are, there are organisations that are really mirror images of the public sector, and let's see them as such, and govern them as such, and treat them as such. And quality should them in just the same way as all public services. But let's accept that some of you guys, like Heather, providing small organisations, should never be in the same room as them. They're different. You can't be competing with those guys. You're never going to be able to do it, nor should you even try. There are some models though around growth, and there are a couple I'd mention. Quite One quickly. would be Emmaus in Bristol, good example. Emmaus is a really nice kind of franchise model. They're separate organisations, but they learn from each other and they grow from each other. Really <coughs> nice model. Mind, another model. Federated model, local organisations, local connections, run by local people, but in a federated model. So there are, I think, models that do show how you can achieve spread and therefore scale through spread, not, not scale through size, and that's the problem. Can I just... Robin, final point. So, um, collaboration versus competition. So the challenge back f from local government to the sector, the voluntary sector and the community sector, is maybe... We all, prefer, we all are so used to competition, and it's easier. Yeah. It's easier to do competition. We're all used to it. We've got rules of the game. That's what we do. Collaboration is bloody hard work. Mm. Yeah. It takes time. It's draining. We fail. We fall out. And one of my other roles is I'm on the SDP, the Health and Care Partnership. If you know that world, it's a bloody nightmare. We have executives in the West Yorkshire with 50 people in the room, and that's the spo that's a small meeting, <laughs> to try and decide about health and care for 2.6 million people. And there are some things around health and care. If you have a diagnosis of cancer and you're in Calderdale, then yeah, you want to go into Leeds for the international quality cancer yeah. care service. Yeah. You want the best care that's one of the best uh, places for care in, in Europe. If you're talking about loneliness, if you're talking about the kind of conditions that actually we're dealing with all of the time, prevention, that's in place, that's in community. So we need to recognise there are different things for different places. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that some of, we all have all got the skills we need yet to do this. And one of my other hats I'm very proud of, and actually the what helps me think a bit like this is Lankelly Chase Foundation. I'm a, I'm a trustee for Lankelly Chase Foundation, if any of you know it. And their job and day-to-day -day with brilliant people is try to get a conversation 
with local places, with local organisations that's relational, that's long term, with funding attached to that, but a long term collaboration. And this is long term work, it's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we've yeah. very sadly we've run out of time. Thank you very much uh, for, all for your questions and for your attention. But can you join me in thanking three really fantastic, <laughs> passionate speakers? Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Adam, for, for chairing that and stepping in at the last minute as well. Uh, brilliant panel discussion. So we have uh, just one minute uh, or so before we need to be out of this room. Uh, so I'm just going to give you just a couple of uh, housekeeping points about what's coming up next. So it's our big glitzy award ceremony tonight, starting at 8 o'clock in this room, which is why we need to vacate so that it can be all uh, jazzed up for us later. So what's going to happen, teas and coffees are going to be available immediately when we leave this room around the uh, foyer area, as they have been all day. There will then be a drinks reception starting at half past six. Um, to entice you to stay around, and then food will be available uh, from seven, uh, with the awards ceremony starting at eight. So no need to leave the hotel. You can pop and get changed if you want, but make sure you don't miss the refreshments, the drinks, the food, and the awards ceremony. It's a great way of uh, celebrating with each other. So don't see it as free time. See it as enhanced networking time with free food and drink. Um, there is a, a reminder, a very important reminder for uh, me locality members. It is our AGM tomorrow morning. We always like to have a bright and early AGM on the second day after a party. It adds to the frisson. So 9 a.m. for locality members. It's your opportunity to hear from trustees about what um, the organization has been doing. Plus, there is a contested election. So hopefully you'll get to meet some of the candidates who are standing out. So we have about 10 seconds. Please leave the building. Thanks. Thanks.